Okay, so I'm Karen Verspore. I'm from the University of Melbourne in Australia. And I'm here for a very brief visit um, and basically just fly in, fly out of Bangalore today. Um, I call it my 36 fly hour flyby, um, just to, to come and join you. And as I reflect on um, why I'm here and what I'm gonna be talking to you about, um, you know, just for context, I'm a computer scientist. I work at the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne. And I'm used to giving technical talks. I'm not used to talking about these sorts of issues. Um, and if I think about how I got to be standing in front of you, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing to you is really my lived experience of being a woman in technology and sort of reflecting on the students that I see in the classroom, the experiences that I've had you know, over my career. Um, and importantly, I think that's informed by the fact that I actually um, have a lot in common with you, probably more than you realize. Um, my father spent his career at the World Bank, um, uh, mostly at the headquarters in, in Washington, D.C., so working in international development and specifically working in education policy. So my framework from home was um, you know, quite uh, related to, to, to the, the themes that we'll be talking about here. And um, in the mid-90s, he spent four years living in New Delhi uh, working for the World Bank there. And so actually he, I've you know, heard through him um, some of his experiences of, of working in India with um, the education context and education policy. So, um, so really, I guess what, you know, I'm coming here because, because I have this combination of my own personal experience um, and it's sort of informed by, um, by the lens that my father um, has given me and my mother. Um, my mother's a very strong uh, woman who set very good examples and high expectations for me. So I don't have maybe the social theoretical con constructs that Vidisha has and you know she has this incredible depth of knowledge of the, the theoretical frameworks but I have my experience. And so what I'd like to talk to you about is um, why I think it matters that we need to talk about um, women in, in technology. So let me um, further context uh, I work in an area called natural language processing. So my research work is actually around trying to get computers to make sense of language. So I love language. So what I have in my title here is a little bit of a kind of linguistic play on words. Um, so I've called this missing women in tech. And I'm actually going to talk about three different interpretations of that phrase, missing women in tech. In tech. So the first interpretation of missing women is that women are missing, right? That women are, in fact, missing from the tech sector. And just to give some context around that, I'm going to talk you through some data, because I'm a computer scientist, I like data, um, or, um, that comes out of Australia. Now, these numbers are not representative of, of India, I'm sure. Um, and they're not even representative of um, the Western world, kind of more broadly. Um, but they're indicative of a problem. And if we look uh, in Australia, the number right now for female representation in the tech sector, in ICT broadly, um, is 28%. And if we dig into those numbers a little bit more deeply, we actually see that the number of women who are in technical roles in the ICT sector um, is quite a bit smaller than that. So um, we have technical and professional roles here at 24%. I've seen numbers out of the US that indicate that engineers at the big tech companies like Google and Facebook are less than 15% female. So women are in the tech companies, but not necessarily contributing directly to the development of technology. They might be in sales, they might be in human resources, but they're not necessarily in customer service they're not necessarily engaging directly in the technical work of the, of the technology. If I look at it from the perspective of student enrollments, and that's obviously important to me as an educator in the university context, um, we have very large disparities in, in enrollments. And if we look at the um, specifically female enrollment in IT, again, these numbers, this data is from Australia across the board, um, we find, uh, first of all, that women um, are a very small proportion, less than uh, 20%, about 18% of our overall IT enrollments um, in the country. And worse, those numbers have actually gone down. 
So while we see a peak here at around 2002, um, right arguably through the biggest growth period for technology as, a, as an industry, women's enrollments in IT in Australia were declining. Now they've started to come up just a little bit here recently, um, and we're working hard to, to try to get those numbers up. Um, but I think this is a problem. You know, we, we just have clear evidence that women are not choosing to study IT. Are those absolute numbers on the... Yeah, these are absolute numbers. Australia is a small country, so, yeah. Oh, I, I don't actually know that off the top of my head, but I imagine it's pretty balanced, yeah. I have no reason to think that there would be fewer women than men. Um, if we look at some other kind of statistics around how, you know, what women are doing before they make that decision about um, choosing IT or not, um, we see that uh, at the high school level, um, we have a two to one ratio of males to females in studying the advanced mathematics subjects in school. So in school already, girls are not choosing to study mathematics. Now mathematics is not ICT, but it is a, a precursor to, to studying ICT. In grade four, which is um, nine, 10 year old children, um, only 33% of the girls that were surveyed are confident in their mathematical abilities. And I've seen this in my own children. Um, I had a, a, a child in grade four who was still counting on her fingers, um, and it shocked me. And when I asked her why she, she didn't want to do better at maths, she essentially told me, ah, it's for the boys. And I thought, hmm, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. So I enrolled her in a Korean program called Kumon, and she's really good at maths now. She's getting the top marks in, in her math test two years later. Of course, she hates me for making her do extra work outside of school, but hey. Year 12 physics, again, this uh, even more imbalanced than mathematics, three to one male, female. So women or girls are not choosing to study these science and, and mathematical subjects that will give them the foundation for going on. Why is the obvious question. And so there was a, 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 a study that was done a few years ago that kind of came up with, um, with this, this sort of analysis of what's going on. And they found that the problem starts right at preschool. So overall, girls are being offered less opportunities to, to develop their interest in mathematics and in science and in technology. Part of that is because the parents have lower expectations. The parents don't think that ICT or STEM in general is a, a good career path for their children, and specifically for their daughters. And so they, they don't actually encourage their girls to, to do things like, I don't know, robotics club at school or any kind of extracurricular activities. Um, it says here, STEM, particularly some fields, and I would argue that ICT is one of those fields, are seen as masculine. And so the, the idea of a girl going into this discipline is unthinkable. The curriculum itself, and some of you are educators or training to be educators, um, the curriculum itself is gendered. And um, they found that, that there were um, very specific kinds of approaches to, to teaching that were simply not engaging the girls adequately. I'll come back to that. Um, and finally, you know, in high school, when they're picking their subjects and they're picking the, the foundations of their career, um, girls are often given uh, advice to steer away from a potential interest in science and technology. So we have these socio-cultural factors which are, which are driving a lot of the choices and the behavior. Um, so I just want to say that, that we have to step away from, from that, right? And you know, again, my lived experience. So I finished my undergraduate degree in computer science 25 years ago. I just went actually back for my 25th reunion, which in itself was a frightening experience. Uh, 25 years feels like a long time. And the one thing that hasn't changed in 25 years is how many women are doing computer science. And um, you know, when I did an undergraduate, my, that undergraduate degree, I was one of a very small number, I think three or four women um, that completed the, 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 the course in computer science at my 
relatively small, um, but very science-oriented kind of university. And um, as I reflect on that, you know, I have really thought about why nothing has changed, right? Why, do we, why are we still seeing only 18% of our undergraduate students um, being female at the, at the university level? And I think it comes back to this issue of not um, supporting uh, the women in the ways that appeal to them and having activities which, which really don't um, suit them and having expectations around ICT and what, the, what their, what their um, career is going to be like that don't adequately engage them. Um, so we're trying a new approach at the University of Melbourne. Uh, this year I implemented in our first year programming uh, class a female only tutorial and um, women can choose now to, to for one small group tutorial session a week, they can choose to be in a group of only women. We've had about um, um, 30 women in each semester choose to do that out of a cohort of about 600 students overall, of which about 30% are women in that first year, first semester programming class. Um, and we're still crunching the numbers, so I can't tell you exactly uh, what the outcome of that's going to be, but it was really my attempt to, to acknowledge that the experience of the women in our first year programming classes is not always positive. They comment that um, they often feel that they are starting behind, that the boys come into these first year programming classes which assume no background, they assume nothing. You've never, you don't have to have ever touched a computer before you take this class. But the girls feel that the boys have been spending their weekends teaching themselves, as you said, kind of learning, going online and learning, maybe doing a bit of you know, hacking in a, in a dark room. Um, and they didn't. They were out doing other things. And so they come to that first class and they already don't know as much as the boys. And, or at least that's their impression, right? Now, I can tell you as an educator that very likely the boys have been teaching themselves badly because they haven't had the educational framework uh, within which to, to learn uh, a structured and rigorous approach to programming. So in a way, we have to undo the learning that the boys have done. But the girls are left with this sense that they're going to be asking questions which are stupid. Um, and they don't feel confident in, in asking those questions in front of boys who appear to know more than they do. So this is one way we're trying to deal with that problem. So what we have is a problem of a pipeline, right? We, we are not getting the girls to go into studying computing or ICT in the first place. And so ways we can, we can deal with that are, are to provide them with opportunities to become engaged, right? We need to build a pipeline. Um, we need to challenge the stereotypes that are out there. And we have to provide them with programs that allow them to develop their skills um, so that it's not such a big, uh, it's not so confrontational, I suppose. Um, and that it becomes an option for them. Now, I don't expect everybody to want to become a, a computer scientist. That's not the objective here. Um, I expect that people will find their passion. And what I want to do is provide everybody with effectively an equal opportunity to, to find their passion. And if their passion is technology, fantastic. If not, I hope they find something else that, that, that really you know, drives them. But without giving people the opportunity to, to explore these ideas, they won't know whether or not they, they like these things, right? And I think for, for technology in particular, it's different than maths and science because maths and science are a standard part of our curriculum from you know, primary school all the way through secondary school and obviously into university. Um, and, and so it just becomes part of life. And in fact, if you look at our university enrollments in mathematics, they're much more balanced. It's just in engineering and technology where we see a much bigger gap. And I think it comes back to lack of exposure. I also think that we need to be thinking about our learning design. Um, and in particular, there's research that, that shows that, we, that girls are, and women more broadly, are uh, engaged by the social impact of technology. 
And so when we think about teaching our students and we give them a problem to solve with technology, that first program they're gonna write, we shouldn't be asking them to write a program um, which is, is all about the nuts and bolts of programming. We should be asking them to solve a problem which matters to them. And that might be things like sustainability problems or um, other problems which require us, again, to solve a problem in a, in a structured and technical way, but have a, a broader um, sense of satisfaction that go along with it. And this has been shown to, to um, improve the experience of, of women in their technical studies. The other problem we have is the leaky pipe problem, which I haven't talked about at all yet. Um, and really the leaky pipe problem is the fact that once women persevere, they make it through, they come up through our pipe, we train them to become technical, and we put them into the workforce, we then lose them. So the number of women that begin a degree in technology and end their degree in technology is actually quite small. We lose, I don't know, what the, I don't have numbers for you. This is one place I don't have actual data, but we know anecdotally that a very large number of women, for instance, don't return from maternity leave after um, they've had a child or adopted a child. And so women in the tech sector are feeling that they can't come back uh, to work. They also leave, you probably heard a lot of, a lot of uh, um, discussion this year around the treatment of women in, in certain companies in the tech sector. And women leave because the environment is not nice for them, because um, either there's, there is explicit discrimination that's happening, um, or because they just don't feel like they're part of the group. They don't get promotion opportunities at the same rate as the men do, and essentially they're being constrained. So we have to fix that problem if we want women to kind of continue on in, in um, engaging in the tech sector. And that means providing role models and mentoring. I'm doing a lot of that myself. Um, fighting unconscious bias, we have to make sure that we're aware of our unconscious bias and, um, and try to, to give people tools for recognizing their own unconscious bias. Um, these are, some of these things are really ingrained in us. There was a study that came out of Harvard where they showed that um, hiring managers that are looking at CVs, all you have to do is change the name from Harriet to Harry or from Harry to Harriet and you get a completely different outcome in terms of the likelihood of this person being selected for an interview. And this applies not just to male hiring managers but to female hiring managers. So just because you're a woman doesn't mean you don't have this unconscious bias against women and sort of thinking that they're, that they're not good enough to do, to do the job. Why is that? I couldn't tell you. And we have to work on that culture in the workplace in order to support everybody to, 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 to develop and contribute and grow their career. Yeah? No, that's, it's everywhere. I think in the ICT, it's a much more entrenched, though, so. There are certain um, aspects to the tech sector which I think um, emphasize, overemphasize the, the issues that are present more broadly. So, you know, you're talking about um, you're an entrepreneur, you're going to start a company. Startups have very, very, very bad record of, of, of treating people with, let's say, lives outside of work well. And a lot of women you know, don't want to work a 14-hour day. Um, but there are many companies that implicitly expect that. And I've seen job ads this year that essentially say, if you're not willing to work 14 hours a day, don't bother applying for this job. And you know, that's not good for anybody. I wouldn't recommend to anybody to work that, that, those kinds of hours. But it, it has a much bigger impact. It, it sends a message. So I think, I think that, that, you know, while yes, it's true, it, it is generally true, um, it is kind of highlighted in the, in the tech sector, or it's a bigger problem even in the tech sector. Okay, 
So the other, another interpretation of missing women is what women are missing by not participating in the tech sector. So the tech sector, very simply, is a massively growing sector. And so one of, the, one of the biggest things that women miss out on by not participating is job opportunities. Um, we, we know that there are massive growth in numbers. And if we look um, at some US data, um, in 2018, the average wage in the tech sector was $112,000. That's a pretty good income. The average wage for all jobs was 54,000. So just by being in the tech sector, you can make more money, right? And that's a pretty, that's almost, that is double, <laughs> more than double. All jobs excluding tech? All jobs overall. So that already includes the 112,000, yeah. Um, you probably all like, yeah, I'll go get a job in America now, right? Um, you know, $1.6 trillion is the estimated direct economic output, output of the tech industry, again, in the US. 9.2% of the national economy in the tech sector. 503,000 tech businesses. New ones launched in 2017, 34,000 new companies in the tech sector. And it's ranked sixth in job creation over the past five years across 22 different occupation categories. So, you know, very simply, there are jobs in tech. And women, if they're not participating in tech, don't have this as, as an option. They're not able to do that. Um, if we look specifically at some of the, the, the jobs that are in those numbers, um, software and web developers are by far the biggest, biggest group. So 1.4 million software development jobs available in the United States in 2018, or 2017 probably. These are a lot of jobs, okay? So that's just math. <laughs> I think more importantly, what women miss out on by not participating um, is that the technology doesn't actually see them. And I mean that quite literally. So there is, um, it's, there is research that has shown that the early voice recognition systems, for instance, could not hear the women. Say, say again? I mean the computer, I mean the technology. It literally doesn't see the women. So here I meant, here I have an example from hearing women. So, you know, you have Google, Google, uh, uh, um, what's it called, assistant, and you have Siri. And the early systems, the early systems that were developed for voice recognition could not understand a woman's voice. Why? Because the engineers who were building these things were all guys. They were testing them in a room somewhere with their own voices. They were being developed with male voices. And so literally, the systems could not hear the women. And you think, okay, where the early voice recognition systems were being developed probably 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, you think, oh, it must have changed in the meantime. Well, um, there's an African-American student at MIT who I read about a couple of years ago um, who discovered that our, our face recognition systems couldn't see her. Um, so she's very dark skinned and the images that these systems were trained on only had white faces in them. And in order for the, the camera to recognize that she was there in the frame, she actually had to put a white face mask on in front of her face. So this sort of, it's not, nobody did this on purpose, right? Nobody, nobody set about to ignore women in speech recognition systems or to ignore black people in, in facial recognition systems. But it's a product of an environment where those people don't exist. And so that's really the problem with women not being there is that the technology is not developed at all with them in mind. And kind of more broadly, you know, besides those kind of obvious physical differences, um, it doesn't consider the use cases 
that matter most to women. I was giggling a little bit when you were talking about going online and, and accessing um, information. Because actually, as I was reading some background material for preparing this talk, one of the examples that I came across was exactly that. Men use the internet for finding stuff out. Who can guess what women use the internet for? Shopping, shopping is one thing. More important than shopping. Cooking recipes, OK. You're missing the big one, guys. Social communication. Connecting with people. Exactly right. So women use the internet. Social media, right? We're the biggest users of, of social media. Men are using it too, but they're not using it for the, for the same purposes as women. And so when we design technology, from the perspective of what do I want to do with the technology, which is how most people develop technology and how most companies develop technology, if the I is of one kind, then we miss the other perspective. So it's been argued that in order to, to have a kind of inclusive approach to technology design, you have to consider the gender dimensions of that design. And that means looking at the functionality, the aesthetics. You can laugh at aesthetics, but aesthetics matters to women. Even the form can matter. So um, there are some early um, smartphones that women found extremely uncomfortable to use because their hands are smaller. And just simply holding the, the device was uncomfortable for them or trying to you know, manipulate the device with one hand while they had a baby in the other or stirring the pot in the other was not possible because of the size of their hand. So simple things like that, taking the perspective of somebody who's a little bit different from the people developing the technology, or at least including those people into the development of the technology is important. And then looking at the ways in which women want to interact, the, the ways they want to communicate, is important for informing how we might develop this technology. So, so this I took from, um, actually there's a kind of design consultancy online where they are um, trying to encourage companies, especially the tech companies, to think about including women in their, in their approach to design. And this uh, I took from, from one of their presentations where they, they emphasize that, that um, men are very interested in details. So exploring features in the technology, and they kind of view technology as a toy to have fun with. Whereas women are much more focused on the functionality of, of the technology and using it as a social tool. Um, and there are a few other, other aspects to this. Um, but, and of course there's a, there's a spectrum, right? We don't want to over stereotype, but um, if we're not thinking about these, these differences, then we're going to end up with technology which only serves the needs of a few. Um, and I think, you know, one, one sort of key summary of this is that women effectively buy products that are designed by men. And if you ask women, you know, do you think that these things were designed with you in mind and your needs in mind? They will tell you no. So 2004, only 1% of women thought that consumer electronics manufacturers ever thought about their use cases when they were developing their products. And a more recent IDC survey, only 14% of women thought that computing and mobile tech products were designed to be appealing to them. And I'm not just talking, you know, making pink razors, okay? This is actually changing the way we think about the technology. So Genevieve Bell, who worked for many years at in Intel, is a fascinating person. She's my, probably my favorite Aussie. She's, um, she's an anthropologist, and she spent her career, you're like, anthropologist at Intel, how does this work? She spent her career um, basically exploring how people use technology. And she did, she's done fascinating things like 
Um, she, she would just ask people, random people, can I dig through the contents of your car? And she did this in various different places around the world, so she's trying to understand how people use their cars and what they have in them. And she would go in and she would, you know, literally excavate the car, right, and pull out every last little thing, tissues and, uh, you know, the spare um, wad of money that the Chinese people keep just in case they have to give a gift to somebody. Um, she would pull all this stuff out and just put it on the, on, on the ground and spread it out and look at how people, um, what people actually were carrying around with them. And you can, you know, you want to understand a woman, find her purse and take it apart and look at what's inside. That's going to tell you what she thinks is important, right? Because she's carrying this stuff around with her all day long. So Genevieve Bell does stuff like that. And the conclusion that she came to is that, um, you know, women are, are lead adopters. They're the fastest category in technology. Um, the vast majority of owners of all internet enabled devices. So that includes things like e-books, e like Kindle readers, healthcare devices, GPS. Mostly women are buying these things. Men buy them too, but they're toys for boys and they're tools for girls. Okay, now, okay, so we've talked about that the women aren't there in the first place and that they're losing out by not being there. But I want to make a bigger point, which is how we all miss out by not having these women there. There's some very interesting research that shows that actually group intelligence is correlated with the proportion of females in the group. Now, arguably there's an extreme. Maybe you don't want to have all women because then we don't have diversity either. Um, but, but generally speaking, the collective intelligence of any group is improved by having more women. Women facilitate social interactions and working relationships in groups. This is what women are good at. They really like to develop those relationships. And that's what then leads to that group intelligence. Women contribute a different perspective on product design, as I mentioned earlier. And there's research that shows that women are more adaptive than men, that they solve problems efficiently within a structured framework. So if you have constraints that you have to work within, women actually are one standard deviation above the mean in terms of being able to work efficiently and effectively within that construct. And if you don't believe me, you can look at the research. Um, I picked out a few quotes. Drawing more women into design, the configuration of artifacts, is not only an equal op employment opportunities issue, as I mentioned earlier, but is also crucially about how the world we live in is designed and for whom. We're designing the world when, when we're designing this technology. If that isn't enough motivation, Let's look at the economics. So it turns out that when there are more women in these groups that have higher intelligence, overall, there's also higher employee satisfaction. So if, if you're an employer, just by having more women there, you're going to have a happier workforce. <laughs> That's pretty good. Most employers want their workforce to be happy because a happy workforce is a productive workforce. And indeed, there's evidence that shows the economic benefits of having women present in these contexts. The average venture-backed company run by a woman has annual revenues 12% higher than those run by men using an average of one-third less capital. So we're back to that efficiency issue. Women are making decisions, I don't know why, but women are making decisions that are good for business. Maybe it comes back to those social relationships and their inherent need to address everybody. I don't know, I don't have the theoretical framework. And if we want to convince the men in our boardroom, and yes, unfortunately our boardrooms are 
predominantly men. We need to remind them of things like this. Gender diversity is correlated with both profitability and value creation. Companies that have more female leaders have much higher profitability than companies that don't. So yeah, so you know, with the gap between the first ranked companies in terms of in terms of female representation and the fourth is 21% profitability mar margin. That's a pretty big difference. And same similarly for value creation. So, you know, if if you're starting a tech company, you might want to think about having some women represented in the leadership of that company. Okay, so that brings me to the end. And just to, to recap, women are missing. They're missing from the tech sector in the first place. They're missing out by not participating in tech. And yet, women have distinct values that need to be considered in technology design. And if we do that, they will bring value. So hopefully I provided you with some things to think about here. Um, oh, and my watch has died. What time is it? <laughs> Good. So um, I can, are there questions? I have another little thing I wanted to talk, tell you about as well. Yeah. So the representation very in our imagery is the teachers or the professors who make the textbooks were all men. So while the textbooks were talking about you know being sensitive towards the gender issues, at the same time they were saying that you know uh, they were projecting a different exactly, idea. All of the pictures were like uh, uh, women are fetching water and men are driving the car. So we yep. are trying to set gender norms. I got mad at the University of Melbourne, and you know, if they, if somebody watches the video, they'll get mad at me. But um, you know, a few years ago, we had we had um, developed collateral for the Melbourne School of Engineering, which we were handing out to prospective students. And one of the key images that they had picked had you know men working in the foreground in in clear image, and a couple of women in the background, fuzzy. And that was one of the primary images that they that they that they used. And I said, and they were like, oh, look, we have men and women. I'm like, yeah, but the message you're sending is that the men are in focus and the women are in the background. And how do you think a woman is going to look at that? They're going to say, I'm not, I'm not central to, to what your image of, of what an engineer is. They were, they were mortified. And of course, they went and changed it. They found a different picture, right? And, and of course, they, you know, it was not at all intentional. There's no, you know, there's no explicit desire to discriminate. There, there may be contexts where that's true, but, but I think in most cases, it is just they don't notice. And because they're not actually um, asking the, the people who, is, who are, maybe is their target audience about this, um, or maybe they don't even think of those women as their target audience. And so they're not, you know, they're just not considering that perspective. And even, uh, especially in school, this plays out like, uh, what do you say, the embedded nature of it. Like they're setting up the sound system for the school assembly. It's always the boys doing it. When it's celebrating in the classroom, it's always the girls doing it. And we're talking about high school versus like seventh grade school. So it's already like more than a decade of conditioning. But this is kind of a chicken and egg argument, but like, I do feel like 
while we don't uh, call into while we don't doubt that men and women are equal in their abilities, uh, are they sort of wired to maybe their preferences of what they enjoy doing might be widely different. And uh, I forget the name of the study, but uh, it was also around like uh, what children, uh, uh, the way they play uh, when they're a year old, when they're two years old, when they're three years old, they're all distinct, like it's always gender. So, uh, yeah, what is that like? There's... Technology is a tool as a toy, all good. I, I mean, I think there are, you know, there are differences between men and women. And, and when, when we talk about equality and equity, it's, it's not about e making everything identical for everybody. It's actually about acknowledging the differences and, and, and you know, essentially allowing, playing to everybody's strengths, right? So, so we, can, we can meet people where they want to be met rather than pushing them into some sort of average box. We don't want everybody to be the same. I mean, actually, that, that's, that's exactly the point, that diversity is positive, that there's benefit from having different perspectives and different motivations. So it's not about trying to, to, to make everything completely equal. It's, it's really about having um, sensitivity to the differences. Yeah, and I mean, there are people who say that, that um, you know, we shouldn't let women into technology because they're not suited to it, right? That there's some sort of, um, you know, biological difference. Yeah, well, exactly, right, Google Manifesto. Um, but, the, you know, everything's a distribution, and I think acknowledging that, that there are, you know, within genders, not everybody is the same, understanding that, that actually, you know, there are, um, different um, use cases effectively. So, you know, bringing it back to a design question, you even just saying I'm going to design for women and I design for men is too simplistic because there are because there are men who are social and there are women who love the nuts and bolts. Right? We can't, you know, you ha we have to be careful not to kind of over stereotype and certainly imposing um, definitely <laughs> I think is problematic. Okay, I um, wanted to share with you something which I'm about to go do. Um, it is relevant. Um, so in, what's today? The 10th? <laughs> in 16 days, I leave um, for my Antarctica journey. And you're probably thinking, what? <laughs> yes, I'm going to Antarctica. And I leave on December 26 from Melbourne, which is why I have to go back to Melbourne tonight, because I still have a lot of work to do before I can leave. And what I'm going to be doing on this trip and why I'm telling you about it is because um, I'm going to be spending three and a half weeks on this trip with 80 female scientists. Um, we're going to be spending half a week in a small town at the very bottom of Argentina called Ushuaia. And then we're going to be spending three weeks on a ship called the Ushuaia, um, traveling around Antarctica. And specifically, we're only going to see a tiny little piece of Antarctica, even in those three weeks. Uh, we're going to be coming out of Ushuaia, passing through the Drake Passage, and then visiting a number of different areas across the closest part of, of Antarctica. So you're probably wondering what we're going to do there. One of the things that we're going to do is, is, is to build on our strengths and develop our social networks as scientists. The objective of the program is actually leadership development. So we're trying to bring these women together to grow themselves as, as leaders. And hopefully be the next generation to start changing those statistics in the leadership profiles of our universities and our companies. A lot of the focus of the program is on personal development. So for me, um, it's, it's really about trying to think about what I want from my life, maybe what personal characteristics I have that are, that are holding me back from, from achieving some of my own personal objectives, and really taking time for reflection um, and learning the tools to help me get from where I am today to where I want to be in 
I don't know, five years time or 10 years time. And for a lot of female scientists, having this opportunity is, is really important because we haven't necessarily been given those tools by our education system um, to really think about that. One of the key focuses of the program is actually climate change. And so part of the rationale for going to Antarctica is actually because Antarctica is, um, I sort of tongue in cheek say, the coal face of climate change. So it's a place where some of the, the biggest impacts of climate change are becoming obvious. Um, the habitats for our little penguins are changing. Um, the weather events are becoming more extreme. The glaciers are melting. And so this group of 80 women is going to be brought there to kind of experience firsthand what's going on there. And as I said, the emphasis is really on leadership and kind of um, you know, developing our frameworks and our tools for, for being able to um, address some of these really kind of confronting global challenges. You're probably thinking, why is a computer scientist doing this, right? Well, my work um, is actually very interdisciplinary. So I use my data science and computer science tools in the context of biomedicine. And I feel like uh, in the context of global health, climate change is actually a very important element of, of our global health. Um, things like pollution even are, are um, actually very important for, for health. And so I've been even working on things like the exposome, so trying to characterize exposures. This program itself is, is um, increasingly diverse. There are 332 <coughs> participants that have, have been doing this program. We're, uh, I'm in the third group, and the fourth group has already been selected. 40 nationalities represented, um, uh, some Indians as well. Um, with 249 different affiliations. We have a big hole in Africa. That's partly because the program is very expensive. And so one thing we're working on now is possibly diversity scholarships to help people from um, more disadvantaged places. Um, we have now, the first program had m um, mostly environmental scientists. And now they've realized that even in this context, it's not just enough to have um, women, diversity through gender, but to have diversity through scientific expertise and skills. And arguably, that's why I'm there as well. So this computer word there probably came from my profile, as well as a few of my peers. But we have veterinarians and doctors and public health experts and um, climate scientists and medical researchers all coming together now. So why only women? Women are globally underrepresented in these leadership positions in science. Organizations, as I said, with more diverse leadership make better decisions. And as I also said, it turns out are more successful. Women scientists often have a very strong desire to have a positive impact on the world beyond their science. It's not just about that next publication. It's about having an impact on the real world. So what better group of people to try to engage in one of our biggest problems? And women need to be equipped to better face the systemic and the cultural factors that we've just been talking through um, that impact their ability to progress into leadership. And so that's really the purpose of, of Homeward Bound. And why Antarctica, which is the other question I get? I already answered this a little bit. Um, but partly it's about being inspired, right? Can you imagine a more inspiring place? I can't. And I'm sure when I get back, I will be able to articulate that a little bit better. But right now, I'm just sort of in awe of the whole idea. It's the, one of the remote, re remote places on our planet. It's extremely cold. Cute little penguins. Not so little, actually, big ones. We have little ones in Melbourne, but big ones in Antarctica. And I think, importantly, it provides us with a quiet space. And so for me, as I'm thinking about what is the whole point of this program, I've realized that for me, actually removing myself from the day-to-day -day phone, internet, all of this is an important part of being able to, to really re focus on myself. Um, I, I don't know how general this 
characteristic is, but I suspect that many women don't really put themselves first. They tend to put their obligations first, their family first, their bosses, their, in my case, my students. I put other people's needs first before mine. And I get sucked into it, you know, every day. And so by being away and having three weeks, three and a half weeks, where I'm only thinking about myself and my science and my peers and my leadership development is a time for me to reflect and hopefully grow in a way that I can't with the demands of day-to-day -day life. It seems really extreme. Go on a ship, which is off-grid, only a satellite phone for emergencies, with 80 women for three weeks. But maybe that's what it takes to get us to actually take that step back. We'll also have coaches. We're gonna have visibility coaches. We're gonna have people helping us understand how to do science communication better and to get our messages out there so that when we come back, we know how to start that kind of process of engaging other people in the things that matter for this planet. We'll also be sharing science with each other. So we're, we're preparing for something called Symposium at Sea where we're actually gonna have a little science exchange happening. So Homeward Bound is really all about developing the scientific leaders that the world needs. And they say, Mother Earth needs her daughters. And so I'll just leave that there. And if you want to ask me questions about that, I'm happy to talk about it. We all, so the, um, it's quite an expensive program. The uh, funding for it depends on your personal situation. So um, I have gotten sponsorship from the University of Melbourne because they are investing in me as a future leader of the university. Um, many of my peers in this group have to do their own personal fundraising. So um, I've gone to so many fundraisers this year um, to help my, my fellow teammates out. Um, and, and so it's sort of, you know, that's part of the process for, for a lot of them as well. It was part of the process for me, asking my institution to support me. Um, it's a lot of money. It was a big ask. Um, and I explained to them why I felt that they should do that. And that was, you know, part of me kind of saying why it was a worthwhile investment for them. And for the women who are crowdsourcing the funding, right, basically trying to, to get their friends and their families to, and their um, workplaces to support their, their effort, um, it's about telling that story of why it matters, why you should support me in this journey. So it's part of the process. <laughs>